Welcome our next guest. I'm extremely excited to have him here. And uh, selfishly, I'm glad to be checking in with him. The last time we spoke was when they went public early this year. But this is Drew Halston. He's CEO of Dropbox. I'm sure you've heard of them. Um, it's a $12 billion now public company. Um, they sold about $870 million in stock um, in March, right? Was it? March yep. 29th. Um, and uh, he was not always CEO. He started out um, basically kind of coding on video games and things like that. But I wanted to give you all an opportunity to pick the brain of somebody, or to, to at least have me pick the brain of somebody who has uh, not always been in this seat and kind of get a little bit more of the insight on the process of how, how you go from um, you know, a, a kid who's, who's coding to somebody who is uh, the chief of a $12 billion company. So Drew, uh, I kind of want to start there. I want to start at the origin story because I, I know it's been out there, but I do think it's important. Um, where did Dropbox, this file storage business at its core, how did this come about? Sure. Well, first, thanks for having me. And it's great to be here. Um, well, the idea for Dropbox came from frustration. So uh, before Dropbox, I started another company uh, doing online SAT prep. It's a whole other story. But that was like my first <laughs> company that I started in college. Um, but one thing I had to do was I had to work across different computers. And the best way to do that was a thumb drive. And I kept forgetting my thumb drive. And the last straw was I, w I just graduated from college. And I was living in Boston, but a lot of my friends had moved to New York. And so I'm like, well, I want to go. They're, they're telling me how great New York is. And I'm like, I want to go visit them. But I have all, also all this work to do on my other company. And, um, and so I'm like, all right, well, if I take the bus, so I, I have like four and a half hours each way. And I can get like nine hours of work done. And da, 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 you know all the gymnastics yep, yep. you do to like rationalize these things. And so I rush out the door, get in, elbow, it's a Chinatown bus. I don't know if any of you have had I've ridden it. I mean, you had the privilege of <laughs> riding the Chinatown bus from Boston, New York. Uh. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's like, it was like 10 bucks and like sometimes it gets there. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so, so I, I sit, you know, I elbow my way onto the bus and, and grab a seat and I'm like, thank, and, and start going our way. And I, and I open up my laptop to start getting some work done, and, and I just re I get that feeling like something has gone horribly wrong, and I realize that like yeah I just left my thumb drive sitting in my computer at home, and so you know how you like search your bag anyway to see if somehow it like teleported into there <laughs> like um, so I'm just sitting there being like okay I guess I'm not going to get any work done, um, and I, and I didn't have any like Family Guy episodes I hadn't seen on my laptop. So, and this was before the iPhone. So this is like late 2006. Um, and so I'm just sitting there, like I'm just like staring at the back of the seat in front of me, just getting like more and more frustrated. Um, and I never wanted to have that problem again. So I opened up the editor and started writing some code to try to hack something together. Creating a company was not like step one. That wasn't really what was on my mind. I was like, this is just a problem I never want to have again. Um, and I wasn't like, I, I don't hate my thumb drive. And, and you can't pull yeah. together teleportation, so yeah. you had to figure out <laughs> yeah. something different. Yeah, and so, but those first lines of Python code eventually, I mean, eventually, very quickly, it took on a life of its own. And and, and I love the or origin story, but also I want to kind of cut through the mystical aura that that the founder origin story has. Um, from there, you said you didn't initially think about starting a company. At what point did it go from okay, this is something I need, and I need to make Make my life easier to, okay, uh, this is something that everyone else needs. How can I get it in other people's hands? Totally. So um, first I was just like, all right, if I, I have this problem and if I solve it for one person myself, like this is a success. And so I'd say the bar started very low, but at the same time I had started this other company doing uh, in admissions or doing test prep. Um, and I couldn't, I wasn't really willing to admit it to myself at the time, but I was kind of burning out on it because I'm like, I love test prep as much as any normal person can, but like, I swear to God, if I have to like write another question about like the trains leaving mm -hmm. Memphis and I'm like. You're on a bus from Boston to New York, you have to get a thumb drive. Um, I, so in the back of my head, I'm like, I, I was sort of looking for these little mm -hmm. side projects. Um, and before, one other one was I, I made a poker bot, which is another story. <laughs> but um, So I was kind of procrastinating on the other company I was supposed to be running. 
um, with the side project, but I just was compelled by it. I was mm -hmm. like, I was obsessed with the technical elements because before starting, uh, founding Dropbox and, and starting the uh, Accolade, the previous company, I had been an intern at startups. I actually started programming because I wanted to make my own computer games, mm -hmm. as you mentioned. Um, but it was pretty clear that this was, that I was, well, I was very interested in it. I wasn't the only person with this problem. Mm -hmm. And then what happened in January, so if, if the that whole bus ride was in November-ish 2006, something really important happened in January 2007, which was the announcement of the iPhone. Mm -hmm. And so before the iPhone, the need to work on different computers was not common, right? And so it's only like people in engineering or people that had multiple computers, relatively rare. Um, but then the smartphone comes along and suddenly everybody has two computers, right? You have your laptop and then you have uh, your iPhone or your smartphone. And, so, and then you have a new problem, mm -hmm. which is how do I get to my stuff? Um, so pretty quickly it became clear that uh, not only was this an interesting technical problem just for, for my interest, but um, that I, would, I could scrounge up enough early adopters who were technical and, and really had that problem already. But soon after founding the company, it became clear that this, this was on its way to being a universal problem. So when you do think about kind of that next step, uh, capturing the audience that is the universe who has this problem, um, what were the personal skill sets that you had to initially back in 2007, 2008, 2009, uh, when Dropbox was in its earliest iterations, um, what were the first things you kind of uh, came to yourself and said, look, I need to do more of X, Y, and Z and less of messing with the code on the back end to run a successful company? Yeah, I got some advice pretty early that um, at the journey from founder to C or technical founder to CEO is a journey from being a coder to a psychiatrist. <laughs> um, and regardless if it's a technical company or not a technical company, as CEO, your job changes every 12 months mm -hmm. um, when you're scaling your company. It's just nobody bothers to tell you that. Um, so first, I start out. My co-founder and I started out just coding, and, mm -hmm. and, that, and that was really all there was to do because we didn't have users, we, didn't really, we barely had a company, um, and before we, we didn't have a prototype. So that was like step one, but then you build, a pro you build a prototype, you need users. You have users, you need revenue. You, have, you, know, you raise money, now you need a lawyer, you need a part-time CFO, you just all this stuff. So the challenge of that is you still have to be, your company's needs are expanding and you still have to be doing everything you were doing yesterday just as well, if not better, than you were doing before, but then all this new stuff comes along. And so it became pretty clear that I just didn't have enough hours in the day mm -hmm. um, to be coding. And so, one of the, and, and then meanwhile, we're doing, uh, we got our initial funding from a group called Y Combinator, who uh, probably you've heard of. They've, you know, they're sort of a, a startup that creates startups um, or an incubator. and. And then we moved out to California from Boston, and then next thing we know, like literally two weeks after getting off the plane, we find ourselves um, with a term sheet from Sequoia Capital, and so we raise our first million dollars. Um, Gets real. Yeah, and we're like, you know, and the thing is there's no real owner's manual for mm -hmm. a startup. And so, you know, just an example of the funding, like so somehow against all of our we thought this was like highly unlikely that two, like I was 24, my co-founder was 21 at the time. You know, we, we go to Sequoia and to, to our surprise and shock, they say yes, mm -hmm. like we want to invest in your company. And they're like, it's some of these little things. So we get an email from someone in the back office saying like, hey, can you send us wiring instructions? <laughs> like, <laughs> the server, the computer wires. I'm like, I'm like, oh. yeah, uh, I'm like all right, uh, so. <laughs> I'm like, all right, well, I still have a little time before I have to respond to this email. So my, my <laughs> co-founder, and like, and the only bank account, I'm like, I knew like from like James Bond movies yeah. what wiring money was. <laughs> but I'd never actually done that. So like my co-founder and I go up to the, to the Bank of America branch in North Beach. And we're like, all right, is this, uh, like, is this like, a, like a, a leather seat problem or can we go like over to the people at the, the kiosk? <laughs> And they're like, this is probably a leather seat <laughs> deal. And so we, we go over there. She's like, very nice. She's like, how can I help you? And like, our only bank account was something we had opened in the mall in Cambridge, like the Cambridge Side Galleria. We got like the, my first corporate checking account. Uh -huh. 
And so we like hand her, like I hand her my, my debit card. And she's like, it's opening up, and she's like, how can I help you? And my question was like, is there a limit to how much a bank account can hold? <laughs> <laughs> and she, she's like pulling up my account. She sees like the balance is $60. <laughs> and she's like, no, well, not really. Like, why? And I'm like, well, can it hold like a million dollars? And she's like, she's like, yeah, I guess. <laughs> um, both of us stopped. I'm like, she wrote down all the little number, the routing numbers, and everything. like, both of us stopped asking questions after that because I don't know what she thought we were. You're doing. robbing the bank. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm like, maybe this stuff happens all this all the time in this place called California where I now live. I don't know. Um, so, but that, that's just, an, and, and so we figured that out, but that's kind of what it is. You're just always figuring out at any given point, um, you know, what, what does the company need uh, a year from now, two years from now, five years from now? Um, and then for me, it's been helpful to, to be systematic about mm -hmm. thinking backwards, to be like, all right, well, how do, I, how do I keep my personal growth curve ahead of the company's growth curve? Which, you know, thinking back to one of our prior conversations before you listed, we talked in, what was it, August of, of last year, and uh, you talked about, you, you had the company, you figured out how to wire their money, you, you know, continue to grow users, you grow this consumer user base, and you expanded into all these different products. But uh, there was a moment there where you said you kind of needed to refocus. Mm -hmm. um, talk us through that moment. Um, Dropbox really took off. It was, a, it was a, you know, a hockey stick of a growth curve, but it seemed like there was a moment of, of reckoning. Uh, talk us through that a little bit. Yeah, so we, we, launched, the, we launched Dropbox publicly in, about, in 2008. And then 2009, 2010, we suddenly have a million users, 10 million users, 25 million users. We raised money at a $4 billion valuation mm -hmm. in 2011. Um, and we're just like, we're, this tidal wave is behind us, and you're just like trying to stay on the board, right? So that, that's the experience of the hyper growth phase. Um, and then we looked at our business, and everything to date had been just like grow, grow, grow mm -hmm. at all costs. The fun stuff. Yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> it's also it's stressful for different reasons. Yeah. But like, you're just like, oh my god, I just hope we like stay alive. Um, you're like, I hope I stay on the board. Um, but then, uh, when you when we thought about okay, who who's Dropbox for? Who's our customer? And it was like everyone, right? And it's like, well, is it individual? Is it people? Is it companies? It's like yes. Well, little companies, big companies, all of the above. Um, and there there were good things about that, which meant that that's how that's what gave rise. The universal need gave rise to a huge market and a big a kind of universal opportunity. But then we found ourselves kind of fighting a war on many fronts. Because when people are like, well, what do you use Dropbox for? It's like, well, what do you use a computer for? Mm -hmm. Right? And so we find people using Dropbox for photo sharing. We find people using Dropbox to back up their phone. We find people using Dropbox to collaborate on office documents at work. And we found ourselves um, both uh, from a competitive standpoint, that was a challenge. Because we're like, all right, on the photo, in the photo realm, we're competing against Apple, Google, Facebook. And the, on the collaboration front, mm -hmm. we're competing against Microsoft and Google. And on the storage front, we're trying to compete with the iPhone to like back up your stuff to Dropbox. Like, can, there's never going to be a world where it's like you, you unbox your iPhone, it's like back up to Dropbox. And so while we had growth and adoption, people were using the product for all these different things, we were becoming really unfocused. Um, and so when I, we had to take a hard look at, OK, what are the, a lot of these problems are getting solved, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of people working on photo sharing. There's a lot of people working on backing up your phone. Soon that's just going to be something your phone does. Um, but we found that when we looked at the experience of using technology at work, we found that like w it was kind of nuts mm -hmm. that like we're still using a lot of. When you think about Office and the Office suites, like they, those were invented in like 1995, right? Or in, like in the 90s. Um, things like email, Office suites, and work the. the in many ways, our industry was like making more tools, but kind of making more of a mess. Mm -hmm. And so we saw that opportunity and decided to focus entirely on it. Um, because, and we, we definitely didn't want to be in a situation where we're like fi fighting five wars mm -hmm. and, and losing five of them. Um, but on the more positive side, we also saw that it, while this is a focusing in, uh, in one way, just focusing on collaboration, when we sort of shifted our thinking from just being, from Dropbox being something to keep files in sync 
to something that keeps people in sync mm -hmm. or keeps a team in sync, it was actually an expansion. Because we're like, OK, now how we think about the problem we're solving has expanded. Um, but but on the flip side, you know, I look back at some of the coverage of Carousel, yeah. the photo storage. Uh, back in 2014, you were so excited. Yeah. And ev like folks in Silicon Valley know you're the product guy. You said you get obsessed over these things. How do you kill your baby? How do you, you know, put that <laughs> stuff aside and say, this thing that I was so pumped about is not what we're supposed to be doing. We need to shut this down. Yeah. Well, well that's the hard part, because everybody loves the idea of focus. One of the first pieces of advice you're going to get is to focus. But what that means in real life is shooting stuff mm -hmm. you love, right? And so before we would made that decision to focus entirely on collaboration, we had launched a photo app. We had bought an email company. We had kind of been expanding and all these different things. We're like, yeah, this stuff is the future of Dropbox. And a year later, it's all gone. Um, and so that's really hard because people were like, OK, cool. Uh, I understand what we're not doing, but what are we doing? Mm -hmm. And even within the company, people are like, well, how is what we're doing anything better than like a 10% better Google Apps? Um, and a lot of the questions that are sort of hard and left unanswered are mm -hmm. sort of left unanswered because they're the hardest questions. Yep. And so suddenly, um, a lot of things happen simultaneously where you know, you're in this hyper growth mode, but then competition becomes real. Um, and the press gets tired of writing about how great your company is and all, and all they want to write kind of the next day is like how it's all a house of cards. And so you sort of go from can do nothing wrong to can do nothing right. Um, and so it, that is really the job. And, I th and, and there's a lot that goes into that. How do you know you're focused on the right thing? Well, it starts, I think you have to start with what is the problem that really needs solving? Right? And, and the reason we were able to, where it made sense for us to focus is like, you know, something like Carousel, which is our photo app, was the first cloud enabled photo gallery. But now all of you in your pockets have a cloud enabled photo gallery that just comes with your phone. So that, that's an example of a problem that was kind of solving itself, mm -hmm. even though we were first. Um, and so we, but when we watch people use technology at work, it's just this fragmented and distracting mess. So we saw that no one was, when we talked to our customers, we realized no one was really helping them with those problems. And then we looked at adoption of Dropbox, and we realized that a lot of, a lot of people were maybe coming to Dropbox for the storage or, or starting with Dropbox at home, but they were bringing it into work. Like millions of people were bringing Dropbox into millions of businesses, in some ways without us even really doing anything. And a lot of what they were paying for when they signed up for a subscription, um, even back then, was to use Dropbox at work. Um, and whether that's just using a pro account, an individual account, uh, at the office or buying the corporate version of Dropbox. And so 80% of our subscribers today um, use Dropbox for work. Uh, but that was even true. That was roughly true back then. So part of it was just following our customers and realizing, OK, this is already what uh, people are not buying storage. Um, this was a big misconception. People weren't buying storage. They were really buying sh sharing and the ability to be productive and collaboration. Um, and Dropbox was the place where they were already going to work. And so it, in many ways, it was just a doubling down on what was already working. But in, when it comes to, we also updated the mission in the company to, to focus on this. And, um, but it's, it's scary for the team, because they're like, OK, this is a big, we got everybody coming after us. Um, there's a lot of un, like big unanswered questions. Um, and, you, and, and it's a challenging thing to navigate through. And unfortunately, we're on the other side of that. Um, and when you're on the other side of it, you get to sort of be like, like, oh, yeah, it was a problem, but we always knew we'd get through it, and it's all good, and failure is awesome. No, it's just like people just thought the company was just going <laughs> to, the plane was just going to hit the ground. And, and look, one of the, the key people in that transition was your CEO, COO, mm -hmm. which you all announced last week. Uh, Dennis will be departing the company in September. Um, when I talk to execs about how you further your company and how you scale, the thing they always talk about is surround yourself with the right people be able to, de to delegate. He was very key to that transition, getting the right people uh, hired, your head of marketing, your head of HR, um, and expanding into new office locations. As a CEO, CEO who loses somebody who's been a key part of the executive board, how do you look at that transition? Well, it's, it's, it's natural, right? Um, and we've had different, uh, we've, our management team has evolved since the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and when we, so, Dennis joined back in 2014 
Um, and we were really looking for someone to help us take the company to the next level, right? Because we were a few hundred people, a few hundred million revenues. So the company is a fraction of the size. And where he came from, well, he was, he ran Motor, he was CEO of Motorola for, for a while after the Google acquisition. Uh, but before that, he ran a $17 billion business at Google. He had managed thousands of people. You know, he had already seen many of this, he had already seen the kind of scale where mm -hmm. we one day wanted to be. Um, and that's a really important, in, in attracting and recruiting those kinds of leaders is a really critical thing if you're, especially if you're in that kind of hyper growth mode. Um, and so we fast forwarded, you fast forward to now, we're a public company of over a billion dollar scale, you know, ten, uh, we're just 2,000 people, you know, offices all over the world. Uh, it's mission accomplished, and Dennis had, it's, it's because Dennis had really has, did accomplish what he came here to do, mm -hmm. and he built an amazing team, and the business in great shape, and, and just as importantly, he built this amazing, amazing leadership bench um, that was ready, and so on the one hand, um, you know, we'll, we'll for sure miss Dennis, and he's contributed a ton to the company, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, it's an opportunity for, for new executives to step into bigger roles, and so... Um, but, but that's, it's natural, like the, the, you, the, you're at different points in the company's growth, you need different kinds of people. Um, and I think it's healthy for there to be an evolution of your team. You are a public company. You do have to manage expectations aside from those just internally. You lost about $2 billion in market value on a strong earnings with the announcement that Dennis was stepping down. So, uh, you know, the read through from those of us who like to read tea leaves is they weren't very happy about him departing. How do you continue to uh, manage expectations with your shareholder base? And does that differ from the type of messaging that you do internally to lose someone who's kind of been a beacon? In for the last chapter of change. Well, I mean, one thing we've uh, that I've I've said to the company is like, look, w now that we're public, we're going to have this new external scorecard that's kind of like our little pinball. It's just going to move around. Um, and if you look at the the first year after IPO of any uh, company, including a lot of successful companies. So mm -hmm. actually, before we went public, we showed a graph of what Facebook's stock chart did in their first year after IPO, mm -hmm. and what Square's uh, stock chart did the first year after IPO. And when you then overlay, like, and, and, it was, and it's all over, the, it's like you would think you're looking at like an EKG, right? Um, and then if you overlay that craziness, if you, if you take their revenue or their, mm -hmm. their business performance, it's just up and to the right, but the stock chart is going wild. So, what I tell the company is we don't control that external scorecard. Um, we should pay attention to it or you know, just don't not look at it, but we should focus on the things that we control. And so we, we talk about our inner scorecard. And, and when we think about who's going to determine the value of our company, at first you might say, well, investors are going to determine the value of the company. And, and that's actually not right. It's, it's really your customers are going to turn, determine the value of their company. Because if they're happy, like, where does the money come from, right? If they're happy, if you're solving their problems, if you're building the best products, if you're driving distribution, make sure your business model, all the company building activities are really what determine, um, determine the success of the company. And so in the short run, it's going to be pretty common for the inner scorecard and the outer scorecard to look very different. But if we focus on our inner scorecard, in the long run, the outer scorecard will take care of itself. Um, and that's been, it, uh, if you look at any of the great tech companies, that's always been the case. Like huge periods of belief and disbelief mm -hmm. and wild swings in the stock price. But then you zoom out on a 10 year timeline and if the, you get the fundamentals right, the stock price will follow. I, I'm curious, I, I'm thinking back to something Bill Gurley of Benchmark, who the firm was an investor in Dropbox, yeah. said earlier this year that um, the hyper competition in the venture capital space has led VCs to perhaps be a little too nice to the executives they invest in while they're private companies. And that's one of the reasons why it's healthy to go public. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, we felt like we were ready. Um, we, uh, because for a couple of years, Prior, we had been running like a public company, mm -hmm. um, and our decision making pro or when, when when we looked at that decision, we're like, look, all of the iconic tech companies are public companies, um, and we will be public someday. But uh, what you want to do is so, so given that, like, let's just go at a good time. And a couple of years before going public, we turned cash flow positive, and we were doing all this work under the hood to build a really healthy and sustainable business and, and be the kind of company that investors want to invest mm -hmm. in. And, and those are companies that 
are, uh, that are leaders, that are sustainable, that have healthy cash flow. And so uh, w it, it was because we did all that work that we feel like we'll have a, a good life as a public company. And I could sit here and keep talking to you, but we're out of time and I have one last question that I'm going to squeeze in and hope they don't yell at me. Um, I am curious, um, from, so we heard the origin, we, heard, we see where you are now. What's one thing that you used to do in your job as CEO, perhaps of a two-person company, three-person company yeah. that you wish you did more of still? And what's one thing that you wish you could get off your plate right now? Well, it's funny, as you, uh, in the beginning, all there really is uh, is a product and a small number of customers. And actually, as the company gets bigger, you, there's this, all this other stuff that you have to do, right? Whether it's go public or um, or just build other offices or all kinds of things. And so, ironically, you have to like keep everybody focused on the fundamentals. Um, and so, um, so what I want for us is, is, is things that we talked about. Like we, we have this inner scorecard. Let's stay focused on that. It's easy to get distracted by all these other things. Um, but we have to focus on our mission, which is to design a more enlightened way of working and build the best products and make our customers really happy. And so that's, certain, that's something that we continue. I, we can't do enough of that. Mm -hmm. um, and something to do less of. I mean, <laughs> one of the more meta things about uh, about my job now or just about the, the path that I've had is like most of my good ideas have come from frustration, right? And so forget thumb drive, like try to solve that problem permanently for like many people. Um, and then a lot of what makes me really excited about um, or, or a lot of what's really motivating for me about uh, helping people work better is it is just such a mess. Like I'm like, I find myself like pulled in all these different directions and you know, managing a multi-thousand person company is just a very different thing. And, and, and so I need help like focusing and making sure that my attention is on the right things and that, um, I can, that we run our team as well as possible. And instead of, and, and right now technology kind of gets in the way of that mm -hmm. because it's so fragmented and distracting. And so I need a much like calmer and simpler um, and more focused uh, experience using technology at work. And that's kind of what we're building, and we're kind of the beta testers of it. So, what was it, from coder to psychiatrist? Yeah, and um, actually back to coder. <laughs> and like back I, to coder. I'm, I'm, and I've been prototyping a bunch of stuff. Like we have a hack week every year, so I was coding a lot uh, a few weeks ago. So you, know, you want to stay, you want to you know, keep in touch with your roots. I think that's pretty important. Well, Drew Houston, CEO of Dropbox, thanks for joining us. Thank you.